You're now watching the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Missanelli Podcast. Well, we, before we get to our special guest, the great Jake Tapper, let me just give you a little bit of what Bet Rivers has going on on their app for the big NCAA tournament. Players can log on each day to the app Bet Rivers. Uh, there is a men's or women's tournament game in the first round, second round, Sweet 16 or Elite Eight, and you can make a big three-plus leg parlay to earn the player a profit boost. That is on the Bet Rivers app. NCAA tournament is here. Good luck to everybody on the Bet Rivers app. You can log on each day. Men's, women's tournament games, first round, second round, Sweet 16, or Elite Eight, and make a big three parlay to win some big cash on Bet Rivers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our next guest on the Mike Missanelli podcast is a very important man, a man who wears many hats uh, for CNN. He's the lead Washington anchor at CNN. Uh, you see him every afternoon. He's also a uh, uh, Sunday co-host with State of the Union. Of course, was the lead with Jake Tapper as the show in the afternoon. He is a writer of fiction. His latest book, All the Demons Are Here. Uh, he is uh, a Philly boy and a Philly sports fan. Let's welcome the infatigable. Mr. Jake Tapper. Hello, Jake. How are you? Mike and Darren, good to see you guys. Thanks so much. Now, uh, when I said many hats, I, f I almost expected you to wear uh, a Philly pro hat uh, <laughs> in this interview. Uh, and I'm wondering if you had to go to your shelf, which one would you have picked to wear for this podcast? I have so, I honestly have, my wife is really actually embarrassed by the number of uh, Phillies and Eagles hats I have, but I would probably wear. Uh, I have this great one from the 1980 World Series. Uh, like it's like the maroon with the giant P. I'd probably wear that one. It's fitted. It's nice. <laughs> well, that's a classic. That's a keeper, especially yeah. in 1980 when they finally broke through with that World Series after uh, getting Pete Rose a couple of years ago. Uh, of course, Jake is the architect of, of a series that I'm just fascinated by. Uh, it's called The United States of Scandal. And, and the hook for this show is that if you're – uh, of my age or Jake age or any middle age. Uh, the, the, when you watch these things, you go, oh, my God, I remember that. And you're just clued into it and enthralled by it. Uh, how did you come up with the idea to do this? Well, I just am fascinated with scandals. And, and uh, CNN uh, had let it be known that they were in the market for uh, good ideas for series. And I thought it would be great to revisit a bunch of scandals from the past and talk to the players that we couldn't talk to at the time, like, you know, New Jersey Governor McGreevy or like Illinois Governor Blagojevich. Um, and in fact, uh, you'll appreciate this as Philadelphians. The uh, one of the ones I wanted to do was Abscam because the the congressman I had when I was a kid and for people who don't know, Abscam was was. Uh, fake FBI bribery scheme where they pretended to be Arabs bribing congressmen. And Ozzy Myers was my congressman. I had, I was represented, my mom, I grew up at second and Carpenter and my mom, I think we had uh, every, like, I don't think we had a representative who wasn't a criminal at, at, at one point or another. We had Buddy Cianfrani, <laughs> we had Vince Fumo, we had uh, Jimmy uh, Tyoon. Maybe we had, Jimmy, we had Jimmy Tyune, of course. We had, um, I mean, we had so many. Anyway, so Ozzy Myers was picked up in Ab Scam, and for people, who, yeah, but there's a movie called American Hustle that's a, that's about Ab Scam, and yeah. um, uh, I wanted to interview Ozzy Myers. He's still alive. He's still alive and kicking. And I thought that would be fun. And we had set out to do it, the series. All the scandals in the series take place basically between. 2003 and 2013, so just in that decade. But I wanted to do Abscam, but right when we started doing this show um, and started filming it and everything, Ozzie Myers got arrested for a different crime, for um, fixing like some local judicial races. Uh, so he was no longer available to us. But maybe if there's a season two, we can come back uh, and I can finally meet uh, Ozzie Myers, my former congressman. All right, now, uh, uh, yeah, Jimmy Tyune was fascinating because there was a columnist named Steve Lopez in town. who Lopez, the him. best, the best. Yeah, Steve was the greatest. Don't be a goon, vote for Tyune uh, was one of his uh, his great lines. Uh, so did you contact these people yourself and then just 
throw caution to the wind to see if any of them would sit down with you? No, we had a we had a production company that um, that did it, although I did reach out to Mark Sanford because I knew Mark Sanford. And that was part of our Mark Sanford episode. For those who don't remember, uh, conservative Republican governor from South Carolina, people thinking he's going to be the next great Republican president. And then one week on Father's Day in 2009 or 2010, uh, he just vanishes and his staff a few days later says he's hiking the Appalachian Trail. It turns out he's in South America with his new uh, lover uh, and much to the chagrin of his wife and the mother of, of their four boys. Um, so I knew and know Mark Sanford. So he was the only one I reached out to uh, personally and he, he declined to do it. But we had a great interview with his longtime chief of staff, which was he which provided insights that maybe uh, Mark Sanford wouldn't have been capable of anyway. Yeah, uh, let's just go down the list. They've been in chronological order. Uh, Rod Blagojevich, who, who was the governor of, of uh, Illinois, who who w- was brought down by uh, allegedly selling his seat in a pay for play situation. It was Obama's seat. Mark Sanford, who disappeared for a week, saying he was on the Appalachian Trail. He was with a mistress in Argentina. You can't write this stuff. John, no. The granddaddy of them all is John Edwards. Yes. Who ran as Kerry's VP in 2004, runs for president in 2008. Uh, and he winds up having a, an affair with a campaign worker who was an actress slash videographer, has a baby with her. His wife has cancer. I mean, just incredible. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, client number nine in the uh, a prostitution ring. And then uh, Jim McGreevy, who you actually got to, to sit down with. Yeah. Let's start in the Greevy and go backwards, because I, 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 I love the way you open this. And my producer, Darren, is from New Jersey. But oh, right. I this share is- this. Uh, this is um, uh, this is a real about, uh, this is a real Philly you, you a real said, Philly intro yeah a real Philly yeah you intro said uh, I ha- I have an inherent mistrust being from Philadelphia I have an inherent mistrust of anything that comes from Jersey although I do believe the Garden State punches way ahead in in its weight in terms of government scale and I used to say the same thing of Jersey tomatoes cheaper gas the Jersey Shore that's it that's the extent of it so I'm curious to know why you opened up with that line. <laughs> Um, because that's how I always felt about New Jersey. I mean, like, it's just like, <laughs> as you, as you note, cheap gas, cheap, full serve gas. Great. The Jersey shore an hour and 10 minutes away. Fantastic. Other than that, I don't, I don't really know what's going on over there. Like it just seems, <laughs> but and you live and you grew up right near the bridge or like right at oh, the yeah. bridge. Oh yeah. It just, uh, I, you know, and to this day, to this day, I have never set foot in Camden. I have driven through it a million times. It's a, it's a, it's like a mile from my house. I have never set foot in Camden. To me, uh, it was always the Camden to me was you're driving through it to get to Cherry Hill or Morristown. And it's, what is it? Admiral Wilson Boulevard. And yes, the old, yes. And the Where old, the Hess station is. Yeah. And the, <laughs> and to me, when I think of Camden, I think of, uh, prostitutes running across Admiral Wilson Boulevard. That's what I think about. Is, is that not an image that you're, you know, you're no, driving there? It absolutely it's, is an image. It's no, it's no right longer an image, but that's absolutely an image. And I'm thinking about something. I heard that line. I go, well, he's not going to make many friends in Jersey. I hope they stay with the show. I love, I love my friends from New Jersey. I love New Jersey. <laughs> but, but, but that was my impression growing up of New Jersey was, yeah, the cute girls were from Cherry Hill at my school. But still, like, you know, that was, uh, why would you go to Jersey? I guess now I understand it. Yeah, yes, yeah, more yeah, whatever. <laughs> Where, wherever the circles are, and diners, and Olive Gardens. Uh, so, so uh, Jake, uh, let, let's go over these just one by one. Uh, uh, Blagojevich sits down with you, and, and yeah. still doesn't, still doesn't think he did anything wrong. Nope. Sanford doesn't talk, and he winds up like getting back in in, in uh, government service and gets reelected. Edwards yep. just, just falls off the map and, and practices law. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, I mean, uh, you know, he kind of tried to make a comeback. And McGreevy seems to be content with, with what all, all that transpired. Which one of these subjects was the most fascinating to you? Well, there's different kinds of fascination. I definitely thought that Jim McGreevy was the one who, as they say in the world of therapy, had done the work. You know what I mean? He understood why he ended up in the situation he did. He had, he had, he had made peace with it. He had apologized to everybody. He seemed legitimately the most repentant. Um, and he was the one that, that at the end of the day, I thought, um, 
seems like a decent guy now. What he did was wrong. He shouldn't have put his lover on the payroll and all that stuff. But he he he, he understands that he did wrong. The most fascinating slash shocking was the one you referred to as the granddaddy of them all, and that's John Edwards. And it's because the degree of of hubris is is Shakespearean. It is something of a Greek tragedy. He is um, this presidential candidate, and he or let's see, he's a he's a he's a senator from North Carolina. Okay, he's a senator from North Carolina, and he not only does he cheat on his wife. Not only does he cheat on his cancer-stricken wife, not only does he cheat on his cancer-stricken wife with an employee of his campaign who's only there because they, you know, they're attracted to each other. Not only does she, he cheat on his cancer-stricken wife with an employee of his campaign, he gets his girlfriend pregnant. Not only does he do all that, he gets another aide to claim that the baby is his. <laughs> and then here's the piece de resistance, which is, he does all of this while running for president while and like with a fairly credible candidacy. If, if Barack Obama had not run for president uh, that year, you can make a case that John Edwards might have beaten Hillary. I mean, it was only the phenomena of Obama uh, that that uh, that defeated her. But clearly he had something. I mean, he he I think he came in second in Iowa. Yeah, I think he came in second in the Iowa caucus. So. It is the ego to think that you can do this and still win and then be president is so shocking. It's completely shocking. Yeah, in fact, your line is someone someday will have to explain to me how a man could cheat on his cancer-stricken wife, have a baby with his girlfriend, somehow can still be a vice president or attorney general. <laughs> it's just the same right. that After he, he dropped had, out, he as, was trying as, to convince Obama to, that he should be the VP or the attorney general. And this is after the story had broken. This yeah, is it is incredible. But you did sit down with Rayelle Hunter, the woman yes. in question. Yes. Here's the way, you know, this is not an easy assignment for you because when you're interviewing these people, you have your own opinions on how preposterous this whole thing is. But you kind of have to hold your cards close to your vest that you yes. can't, you don't want to scare them that they, they take off the microphone and, and go out there. But here's the thing you have perfected I've noticed about you. I can see an eye roll with you when you <laughs> don't give an eye roll. It, it's a gift. And, and I know that you've perfected it that way because I'm watching you interview Real Hunter. And some of the stuff she's saying is just flat out ridiculous and laughable. And you're just stoic about it. How'd you pull that off? Well, that is the job, right? That is the job. Years of training, of listening to people lie and say silly things or whatever. I, I truly actually feel sympathy for Real because as she noted in the clip that you ran, she kind of was created yeah you know, she was she was treated as some sort of Jezebel when you know at the end of the day she wasn't cheating on anybody John Edwards was you know the, and, and it's often that the woman gets the heat for it I I did and I did an un eye roll eye roll when she said that there was nothing sexual about it about their first encounter and because she had just told the story which was she goes up to him at a bar in New York says you're so hot and then they have a little conversation and then he invites her to his room. And that's the first time they were intimate. She said, but it wasn't sexual. I'm like, it sounds pretty sexual. <laughs> it sounds, I mean, it sounds pretty yeah. sexual. They talked on up, the corner. Next thing you know, they were in the hotel room having well, sex. And, and, I, and I, I'm listening going, oh, my God, I'm, I'm looking at you more than I'm looking at her going, <laughs> how does he not just bust out? It's, it's a phenomenal gift. It really is. And you Thank do you. it a lot on your show where some comments that you have on from – people from the Republican persuasion come on and, you know, and you just, you're stoically, you're different than a lot of the people on CNN is that you keep your face, which is admirable. Well, thanks. It's uh, just, you know, lots of Botox makes it impossible to move <laughs> any muscle in my face. Obviously not true. If I had, I would have a lot fewer wrinkles if I used Botox. Yeah. I mean, it just, the job is just to listen to people and get them to say things. And sometimes it is more effective to not say anything than to say anything. Sometimes then, you know, they hear the science, silence and then they rush to fill it with some sort of further nonsensical statement. But thank you. Uh, yeah, and of course, the last one you're doing, I guess, for this season, I, I hope there's another season to it. Valerie Plame is, the, is, is your yeah. last one, I assume, for this season. Is there another yeah. season planned? 
Uh, I have not gotten any official word of season two. I mean, I think, you know, the show has been rating very well. It's been number one in the key demo. Uh, and often it's the number one show on CNN on Sundays. Um, so I wouldn't understand them not doing it. But, you know, this is this. These aren't decisions that I make. Um, it would be fun. And I think you could do a season of Hollywood scandals, a season of financial scandals, a season of small town scandals, a season of scandals from the 70s. I mean, you could do a whole bunch of different themes that I think would be really interesting. I don't think we should only limit ourselves to Washington, D.C. scandals, um, although there's no shortage. I mean, you could do you could probably do a whole season just on George Santos, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and of course, for Jersey people, the message of McGreevy uh, that, that where it came down when he announced as a gay man, and and a lot of you know, the backdrop of that whole thing and the undercurrent was he kind of got off the hook that, that that the gay angle took away from the corruption that had permeated his whole uh, right. uh, tenure as the governor. And I, I, I guess the, I don't know if he recognizes that. Did you get the sense that he did? Uh I think he, I think he, he, he sees it. The stuff you're talking about, the stuff with Charles Kushner and, and, um, and also the, 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 the most corrupt thing that actually happened is him putting his, uh, lover on the payroll as his Homeland Security advisor, uh, Golan Sapel. Um, and, but beyond that, there are obviously a lot of allegations about pay to play and, and the like, um, ones that then U.S. attorney, uh, Chris Christie started investigating and that ended up, with uh, Charles Kushner, Jared Kushner's dad, um, hiring a prostitute to sleep with his brother-in-law, his sister's husband, in order to, I mean, by the way, you could do, you could do this, this would be a fascinating <laughs> episode too, to, to just the Kushners, um, it, to, to hiring a prostitute to sleep with his brother-in-law, uh, who he thought was going to testify against him in this corruption probe that Chris Christie was doing, and then delivering that videotape of of this encounter to his sister, I think on her birthday, this is what Charles Kushner did. Um, anyway. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that has tremendous layers to it, which, which makes this series so intriguing. It's fascinating. And I've recommended people watch it on uh, my Twitter account and on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, and, but uh, obviously one of the other reasons I wanted to have you on is your affection for Philadelphia sports. You made no bones about it being a big Eagle fan when they got to the Super Bowl and the whole bit. So yeah, talk to me about your Eagle fandom growing up in the society whole area and living this whole craziness of Philadelphia sports. Your dad being a, a physician uh, down in that area. So uh, and you, you went to uh, Akiba Hebrew, I believe, which is right around the corner yeah. from where I, I'm doing this podcast. Was oh, that right? Uh, tell me about how you you got caught up with the Philadelphia sports scene. So first of all, the, the two uh, prominent Akiba alums who are in the world of sports, Heim Bloom, former general manager of uh, the Red Sox and Mitch Album, of course, is an Akiba alum. Um, the uh, uh, I mean, I just, you know, I, I was born in New York, but I moved to Philly when I was three months old. And so I'm just, I just think, consider myself a, Phil a Philadelphian and, you know, I, I, some of the, my favorite memories in the seventies are watching the Phillies and, you know, collecting baseball cards. I remember when Pete Rose came on board in 79, I remember so much about the world series and that team in 1980 um, it just, it was just, I mean, the early eighties when I was, I turned, uh, 10 in 1979 and the early eighties, there was no better time to be a, a little boy, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old in Philadelphia. We were in the 81 Super Bowl again, the Eagles against the Raiders. We were won the 80 world series. We won the NBA championship in 83. It's gotta be the last time we won that. Uh, with Dr. J. And Moses yeah, they went on. to the finals. The Iverson team went to the finals against the Lakers in 2001. Uh, yeah, but it's the last time we won was 82, right. it was 83, 83, 83 season. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's um, it's very uh, that's just a very formative time for me. Um, and, you know, my my son, I'm raising him to be an Eagles fan, which is which has been easy because they've been in two Super Bowls in six years, although the complete and utter collapse by the team, you know, he, he, he uh, broke his heart. And uh, I said, well, now you really know what it's like to be an Eagles fan because every, <laughs> cause, cause 2018 to 2022 was that's anomalous. That's not, that's not what the team is normally like. We're not always making the Super Bowl. 
having the team completely collapse for reasons unknown uh, is that you know, if the that, commanders build with this new ownership and new direction, do you fear that he would swing? No, no, he's, <laughs> he's got it. And, and he's a huge fan of, the, of Jason Kelsey. And um, no, I mean, no, we're not we're not raising the kids to be fans of Washington in any sense. My <laughs> wife is my wife is from Kansas City, and she's very uh, she's very she's much very much a homer for the Kansas City team. Um, and uh, I'm a I'm a Philly boy, and so well, she's got a leg up on you right now. So I want to ask you, what do you think of the state sure. of Philly sports uh, as we exist right now? Unsettled, very unsettled. Uh, too many injuries. I'm worried about. Bryce is back. I'm worried about Joel's entire body. I'm worried about, <laughs> I mean, I'm excited about um, Barkley joining the Eagles, but I don't know. I'm still not exactly sure what happened last season. Do we have any, do, do we know what happened? Why the team completely collapsed and why I, I, I'm still, I still don't fully understand. Uh, I don't either. And uh, th that's why I was very hard on the head coach who was unable to stop that bleeding. So we'll see. Uh, I, I think he has this year to, to really save himself and the team. I'm not so sure they are a contender this year. Uh, and the Sixers are just a big mystery. But the one constant yeah. happens to be the baseball team. Yeah. Yeah. The, what do you mean? Just how good they are? or just Yeah, how they're, they're, they're the team you can rely on as being a contender. Yes, I agree. I was sad to see. Um, I was uh, now his name's escaping me because I'm uh, an idiot. But I was I was sad to see the first baseman go. Um, Reese Hoskins. Yeah, I was I was sad, sad to see Hoskins go. I understood the decision. Um, no, I'm excited about the team. Hey, you know what? This was really cool. So in 2022, I was in Ukraine covering the war, and I wore a Phillies hat in front of like a a stack of sandbags in some photo that I, I tweeted or whatever. And I heard from a guy I know on the Phillies, not on the Phillies, a guy who works in the office of the Phillies. He says, Hey, Mike Schmidt reached out. He wanted to know um, if I had your number. Can I, can I give him your number? I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You could give Mike Schmidt my number. Yes. And so I've gotten to know Mike a little bit and I've gone to a few games with him and, uh, oh, nice. and Boa, I got to know Boa a little and uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. And like, you know, he wants to talk about politics and I want to know about like the 1980 world series. Well, listen, right now you're way bigger than they are, even no. though they had great careers. No, oh, you no. are. There's, a, there's no question. Let Definitely me ask you, true. cause I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a, a little bit about politics here. Uh, I am um, a dyed in the wool independent, which yeah. means I lean a little bit more to what makes sense. And I think the left makes a little more sense. Uh, but I am uh, I, I am bewildered that people what what makes people gravitate to Donald Trump. Now, you study this on an everyday basis. I, I see one thing and uh, a lot of people see so many other things that may make him again the president of this country. What yeah. is it that is the connection to the people that Donald Trump has? And I'm talking about even intelligent people. Yeah. So, you know, there are what, 350 million Americans and each one of us has our own view on the world and not everybody's view jibes 100 percent with ours. And that's just a fact. And that's why, you know, if you have a disagreement with your wife or, or whatever, it's because you don't see the world the exact same way because no two people do. So I can't speak for every person who supports Trump. But I will say, I think that there are people who think that before COVID hit, uh, the economy was cranking along and he was getting rid of regulations and lowering taxes. Uh, and they fought, they thought that he fought for them, that he, you know, he, he actually, they, they renegotiated NAFTA and they were focused on trade and a lot of things that the Republican party in the past had said that they would do, but never actually did. And I think that there's, that is part of it. I think that he speaks to, a degree, you know, to one side in culture wars. Uh, and I think I think to a lot of people, he hates all the same people that they hate or the people who hate him, they hate. So, I mean, I think there are lots of different complicated reasons as to as to as to why um, people like him. I mean, they look at the world and they think it's so chaotic right now. Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, Hamas attacked Israel. I mean, 
th- and they hear the argument, well, that stuff didn't happen when Trump was president, and they're susceptible to that argument. You know, I don't, I don't know that that's a fair argument, but you know, they hear it. What do you think the chances are that he gets elected? And if so, what will our country look like? I think, I mean, I think if the election were held today, based on polls, he would win. Uh, and probably pretty significantly, if there are six states that are um, in contention, uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, uh, I think he would probably win at least five of them today. But the election's not today. And I don't know. Uh, I think that I don't know what's going to happen. I think that, you know, he has been hidden from view in a lot of ways for a lot of the swing voters that will decide this election. You know, they haven't been paying attention to him because he's been pretty much safely ensconced on his own social media site and his own media on Fox and Newsmax and channels they don't necessarily watch. Um, And I think maybe when he comes out, people will remember other reasons why they don't like him. Um, And also the abortion issue, I think, will be helpful to, to Democrats uh, in, in these, in these swing states. But I, I, what the country will look like after, if, if, and when Trump gets elected, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I'm tempted to take him at his word, uh, that he wants to, um, make a lot of significant changes to the way this country is governed and be a dictator on day one. Um, not a lot of people who are dictators on, for a day tend to want to give it up, but we'll see. Let's take him at his word. He only wants to do it for a day. And then, you know, I think he was very disruptive when it came to the normal order, uh, when it came to NATO alliances, when it came to foreign policy, when it came to domestic policy, when it came to respecting the rule of law, when it came to respecting Congress. I mean, he talks now about immigration and he's responsible, I guess, for this compromise deal being sandbagged. He didn't put any work into it to get an immigration reform bill passed when he was president. So I think it will probably be a lot of chaos, Um, you know, but there are probably a lot of Americans who look at the border and look at Ukraine and Israel and think there's already a lot of chaos. And it's so maybe it's just two different kinds of chaos that that is that are that are in in people's minds. um, That is they just have to decide which one they they like the least extremely diplomatic answer of you. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. There's the last question for you. Cause I read this in your bio and I don't know if this is true or not, but I'll run it by you. Uh, a very young, you're, you're, you're obviously a happily married man with children and raising children, but a very young Jake Tapper on the Hill. It says that you had once a platonic date with Monica Lewinsky. I did. Is that true? It is true. And uh, right before the Clinton Lewinsky scandal broke in 98, was it something like that? Uh, I met her at a going away party for some friends and uh, got her number and we went out for dinner one night and it was pretty, she was about to move to New York, uh, didn't have a job lined up, which seemed odd to me. Why would you be in such a hurry to get to New York um, with uh, no job lined up? But now we know she was getting a lot of, <laughs> getting the hell out of Dodge. And um, yeah, the whole scandal, that was December. And the whole scandal blew up in January and uh, it was wild. It was, it was a wild thing. I wrote about it actually for the Washington city paper, uh, which was my first full-time journalism job. I wrote about our date and it's really kind of just like a look at the, the Washington culture of scandal, honestly, and how everybody was so excited and joyous. But I, you know, I'd met this girl and she seemed nice and not worth destruction which everybody was doing right then and there, uh, including the White House. Uh, and so, yeah, it was a true story. And she's a good person. And what happened to her? We talked earlier about how real Hunter got blamed for what John Edwards did. And Monica Lewinsky, in a lot of ways, got blamed for what Bill Clinton did. So when it, when this scandal bro- breaks, you're looking at television going, oh, my God. Yeah, I just had dinner. With, <laughs> I had dinner with her a couple months ago. It was so and it was I was on I was I had just gone scuba diving with my dad in Little Cayman, and he couldn't be less interested in scan- in political scandals. He's just like, he thinks he's just not interested in, in that kind of thing. I don't even think he's watching the series, to be honest. <laughs> and um, I mean, he watches everything I do, but like, it's he probably just isn't interested. It's not his thing. And I was like, oh my God, dad, Bill Clinton's in trouble, President Clinton's in trouble. And I know this girl, 
and he was not interested. And it was, this is 1990, whatever. So I didn't have a cell phone. I was going crazy. I needed to tell somebody, you know, <laughs> and I, I, it wasn't until I got back to the United States that I was able to tell anybody like, I know her, I know her. <laughs> you remember what you ordered? No, I don't. I don't. Pey it was Peyote Cafe was the name of the restaurant. I usually got the calamari there. Uh, okay. So you had calamari. Jake, this has been a pleasure. Of course, Jake, I don't know how you do it. I really don't. I, you, you, know, you have a family you're raising. You're writing novels. You're, you're on CNN six days a week. It is amazing. And it's very admirable. And I really appreciate you doing this for us. And I know the people so in Philly will love it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Mike and Darren. Thank you. Thanks to Jake Tapper, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jake.